Hi, and welcome to SLU, your interface for outer space. I'm Eric Edelman, your host for this evening as we celebrate the solstice with some very special guests, including Bill Nye and Phil Blake. And I want to say a special hello to those of you watching from any of our partner websites here today, The Washington Post, ABC News, The Weather Channel, and The Old Farmer's Almanac, among others. We are so glad to have you joining us, and we invite you to come join us over at slu.com, too, where you can participate in our community, find out about upcoming shows, control telescopes, all that good stuff, as you enjoy our live show here today. So yes, friends near, friends far, welcome. So this solstice isn't as much of an astronomical event in the classical sense of what we often see here at SLU. This won't be any overlapping overlaying of two distant celestial bodies like an eclipse or a transit. We won't be seeing a meteor shower or counting down until a probe lands on a speeding comet. This isn't an event in that kind of sense, but all the same, the BBC News just was reporting that around 13 thousand people were gathered at Stonehenge this morning for the solstice. We're excited about the solstice because the solstice is not so much of a momentary event as it is a culmination of the sun's yearly movement across the sky and a celebration of what we experience here on Earth, the changing of the seasons and of the light that we get on this planet. Today in the Northern Hemisphere, we have our longest day of the year, the longest period of time the sun will be up in the sky before it sets, with that sun being the highest in the sky that it gets throughout the year. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, this is the shortest day of the year with the sun lowest in the sky. We get some symmetry, some excellent light, some excellent topics to talk about. And so as we talk about the sun, well, we'll be looking at it too. We have a live view here from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. We'll be looking through a few of their feeds, uh, one of them being in extreme ultraviolet, uh, this one here uh, highlighting the outer hot layers of the sun. Uh, for example, the solar corona, which is something that if any of you are excited about the upcoming total solar eclipse, that's one of your rare opportunities to see the solar corona when you don't have this solar dynamics observatory to do it for you. We also have, I believe, a second feed from the solar dynamics observatory, a little lower in the energy of the wavelengths we're looking at, but also in extreme ultraviolet. We might be seeing a bit of the chromosphere uh, as well. I see. Okay, I think we have it right over there, uh, which is also a layer that really isn't that accessible to us outside of a solar eclipse. It's very thin compared with the bright, bright photosphere uh, that we see if we want to damage our eyes and look directly at that sun. We also have the SLU camera views as well. There's a solar scope that SLU has in the Canary Islands with an H-alpha filter. Uh, here are some beautiful views of the sun via that very scope itself that were taken just yesterday. And we're also going to be bringing you some wide shots of the solstice from across the country. And here today to talk about the sun, the solstice, and what all of that means. We have a great group of pretty cool guests that will be talking about some pretty hot topics. So who are the guests here today? Well, we have the marvelous Bill Nye, the science guy, CEO of the Planetary Society and host of Bill Nye Saves the World. And he will be talking with us about the science of the sun, solstices and looking actually beyond the solstice toward the transcontinental total solar eclipse. And alongside Bill, we have Phil Plate, a prolific writer who you might know as the columnist for Bad Astronomy and also a host of Crash Course Astronomy. And with Phil, we'll be talking a little bit about some of the common misconceptions about the sun, about the solstice and eclipses. What do we think is happening, which might not necessarily be the case. And alongside of these great guests, we also have Matt Penn, who is the coordinator for the Citizen Kate experiment. So he'll be talking to us about what that is. It's a pretty massive undertaking uh, with a plan to look at the sun from dozens of locations across the eclipse line. And we also have Ari Sashlari, the Weather Channel's The Ari Effect, and he will be talking with us a little bit about what weather we can expect along the path of totality, the eclipse path, where will be better places to look in terms of a decent weather forecast to be expected. And alongside these guests, we also have Paul Cox, the observatory engineer for SLU, who will be telling us a way to view the eclipse with all these SLU folks here in Stanley, Idaho, a great place to go. Paul will give us details about our big road trip in August and how SLU members can join us there. So yes, this is a jam-packed show, lots of solar views, lots of guests, and so be sure to stick around for all of our amazing guests and live feeds. We'll be seeing the sun, talking about the sun, and celebrating the solstice. It all starts just in a moment with Bill Nye. Don't go away.
We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at slu.com. Space is limited. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our celebration of the June solstice here on SLU. I'm your host, Eric Edelman, and we are kicking off today's celebration with a very special guest, Bill Nye, science guy and CEO of the Planetary Society, will be joining us in just a moment to talk about all things solar and to discuss his commitment to bringing space and science to the world. But before I introduce Bill himself, I wanted to introduce our newest SLU team member, Dr. Paige Godfrey, who will be speaking with Bill in just a moment. Hi there, Paige. Welcome to the show. Hi, Eric. Thank you. So uh, rumor has it you have a very interesting connection to our special guest. Isn't that right? I do. And let's see if he remembers. Uh, back in April, I was giving my dissertation defense at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And Bill and I walked in in the middle, took a seat right in front, asked me a tough question about a plot on uh, one of my slides. And then after he was satisfied with his answer, he left. So I did get to meet Bill and I. <laughs> That's wonderful. So we'll see, you know, what comes of this conversation. Uh, take it away, you two. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Well, as Eric has said, our first guest this evening is none other than Bill Nye, the science guy, CEO of the Planetary Society, a science communicator and educator, and host of the Netflix series, Bill Nye Saves the World, which has recently been renewed for a second season. Bill, welcome to the show. It's so good to be here. Uh, is my picture up there on your electric website that the kids are using with their computer machines? Doesn't quite look like it. No, open, it's not. We can hear you, though. Anyway, so here's what happened, everybody. There, there we are. Go. Hey, Bill. Uh, uh, Paige, Dr. Godfrey, was defending her dissertation, and she had units in angstroms. <laughs> they're okay units. That's 10 to the minus 10th meters. It's, it's okay. But it's fallen out of favor. When you go to, when you talk to a spectrographer, one who deals with colors, he or she is pretty much into nanometers, 10 to the minus ninth meters, a billionth of a meter. It's sort of throwback that astronomy uses angstroms. And furthermore, also in addition to continue in hilarious comedy fashion, she was at the American Museum of Natural History, which as you know, is directed by none other than whom? That's right, Neil deGrasse Tyson, everybody's favorite. And Neil likes the old units. That's my impression. He thinks it's kind of charming. He likes Fahrenheit. He wants to say degrees Kelvin, which is uh, uh, not right. It's wrong. Uh, it's incorrect. It's Kelvins. There's no, they got rid of the extra symbol. Anyway, ne neither here nor there. But let's talk again briefly, uh, Paige, about me. Me, yeah. me, me. So, <laughs> well, I'm thank you for your introduction. Jokes. <laughs> CEO of yeah. the Planetary Society, because I took one class from Carl Sagan, a famous astronomer, many years ago. I took it as an elective when I was in engineering school. I was just messing around. And largely through the influence of Neil, now I'm the CEO of the Planetary Society. And for the eclipse this year, we are uh, participating in the sales of glasses that enable everybody to look right at the eclipse. And... Uh, they look like this, and if I put it on the lens, you, uh, we go away. The, uh, they are very, very dark lenses. They're designed to look at the eclipse, the planetary society here, I'm over here. And I really encourage everybody to get a pair of glasses. These, these plastic ones are real nice, they're very nice. But the paper ones are also available, they're also good. And I mention this because it is an extraordinary thing. I've only seen one total eclipse. I've been around several partial eclipses, but the real total one, when the stars come out and the birds get confused, and so it really is a spectacular thing. And I understand that in the bad old days, before humankind really understood what the eclipse, what an eclipse was, a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse rather, where the moon passes between us and the sun, uh, people didn't know what it was and they were scared. 
and I imagine they invoked uh, any deity they had, they thought they were in contact with. It really is a spectacular thing. So if you guys can get to Idaho, any viewers, or uh, I'll be in uh, Beatrice, Nebraska, uh, any place like that, that in southern Illinois, it's really a spectacular thing. I, I can't say enough good things. As Bill said, yeah, SLU will be in Stanley, Idaho for the transcontinental total solar eclipse in August. We're going to be with our SLU members. Um, you can register for free on our website and join us in Idaho, if you'd like, and we are selling those awesome glasses that Bill displayed for us. So Bill, I have a question. Um, yes. We are celebrating the solstice today. And so we're talking about the eclipse as we celebrate the sun, the longest day of the year. This day so means, <laughs> great. This day means many different things to people. Some people find it extraordinary. Others might not fully understand the purpose. What do you enjoy the most about solar solstices? Well, the solstice, it's the official start of summer. I'm a fan of summer. And uh, it's also a remarkable thing that humankind was able to figure out uh, what's going on with planetary motions. And for example, the Babylonians did their best to embrace a calendar with 360 days a year. And they like 360, the same reason anybody does. It's six times 60. Six is divisible by two and three. 60 is divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20. It's a fantastic number. However, the Earth doesn't go around the sun in 365 Earth days. <laughs> 360 Earth days. It takes 365 Earth days, excuse me. And so the Babylonians had to sprinkle in some holidays to make it come out right. But we understand it with extraordinary precision. We know the moment that the... Uh, that the stars line up in such a way that when we observe them from the Earth's surface, we know that the, that the uh, summer has started, that we will have the longest day of the year. Appreciate our ancestors is what I'm saying. And their remarkable diligence to learn about our place in space and our relationship to the cosmos. So everybody, if things go really well for you and you live to be 82 and a month and three quarters, you get 30,000 days. Now, many, many people will live all of those 30,000 days and a few more or a few fewer and never experience a solar eclipse. But for those of us watching or participating in this webcast, this podcast, this webcast, I'm pretty sure you have a shot at seeing this, this uh, extraordinary eclipse, which is going to go right across the world's third most populous country. So if you get a chance, drive to where you can see it. It only lasts a few minutes. You don't need six, you don't need a hotel room for two weeks. Just drive there, watch it, get moved, and uh, go about your business. And I hope it changes your life a little bit and it helps you appreciate your place in the cosmos, what I like to call our place in space. Very inspiring. Can you tell us a little bit about the Planetary Society and what your goal is there? Well, our goal, our vision, is to have every citizen of the earth know the cosmos and our place within it. That would be a fantastic thing, to be empowered, to know your place among the stars. That's our vision. But our mission is to advance space science and exploration. And we do that in three ways. Thank you for asking, Paige, Dr. Godfrey. Thank you. We do that in three ways. We educate. We have remarkable journalists. I encourage you to visit planetary.org. We educate, uh, rather we uh, uh, create. We built our light sail spacecraft and flew it successfully. And everybody, we have a light sail two spacecraft, all finished, passed all the tests. And we are on the manifest of the second Falcon Heavy, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy with 27 plus one, 28 engines that will um, uh, take heavy payloads to low Earth orbit and beyond. We're, on, we're waiting for that rocket to be ready. And then the third thing we do is advocate. We have three full-time policy analysts who spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. As we say, Washington's a small town based on relationships. And we encourage congressmen and senators and their staffs to embrace the idea that space brings out the best in us. Not only is it financially fantastic for your state if you have a NASA center in it, or if you have uh, 
citizens of your state that do business with NASA centers. But it's also inspirational. And just think how the world would be different without NASA, Na National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the European Space Air Agency, the, uh, the uh, Chinese Space Administration, the Roscosmos, the Russian Space Administration, the Indian Space Research Organization. Vietnam has a space program. South Africa has a space program. And we work at the Planetary Society to get everyone in the world to be empowered to know the cosmos and our place within it. That is, thank you for asking, Doctor. Oh, thank you for explaining it to us. That's amazing work. And the join us, planetary.org. I'm here for you, man. <laughs> the community is very fortunate to have the work that you all are doing. Can you just uh, tell us one last thing, what your favorite thing about space is? What draws you to, to understand oh, the cosmos? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I'll tell you something that gets me every day, and, and I don't mean it, it obsesses me all day, 24-7, but every single day I reflect on the following remarkable discovery. You and I are made of stardust. We are made of the dust of exploded stars, or perhaps some uh, loose uh, elements and atoms that were in the cosmos as part of the cosmic uh, ether or what have you, the uh, inter interstellar space. We're made of that material. So you and I are at least one way that we, we, the universe knows itself. We are part of the universe and we are part of the universe discovering its own nature. We are nature's way of knowing nature. That Every day that gets me. And I know many people uh, have looked for what we would call an origin story. Uh, we want to know everybody you ever meet wants to know where we came from, where each of us came from. How did we all get here? Well, science or astrophysics or astrobiology or astronomy writ large is how we have made this discovery that is profound and provably true. And it just fills me with reverence every day. I, I, every day I'm just amazed that I have this opportunity, that each of us has this opportunity to live among the stars and know it. And it is very reasonable, everybody. It is very reasonable that even in my lifetime, and certainly in yours, doctor, we will discover life or evidence of life on another world. That will be profound. That will change the course of human history. It will be like Copernicus or Galileo, who made these profound discoveries, which changed history. I mean, when Copernicus showed that the, it's much better to presume the planets going around the sun than the sun around the planets, everybody still went to work the next day. They carried on, but eventually it soaked in and it enabled uh, terrestrial navigation, it enabled international commerce, which is still affecting us every minute of every day, even now. When uh, Galileo questioned these fundamental ideas, you know, the moon is pretty round, but it's full of craters. And you can imprison me in my own house, but it's still full of craters. Sorry, man. And these objective truths uh, are fantastic and wonderful. And so we are part of an extraordinary, what I would call new golden age of space exploration. And thank you very much for including me in this webcast. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for talking to us, Bill. It was great to have you join us and it was great to see you again. It's a pleasure. Great to see you again. Just move, can you just recalibrate to, to nanometers? Actually, and, we and didn't tell like Bill I just said it was a good idea. And Neil, I love you, man, but it's Kelvin's. It's not, you can't say degrees Kelvin. I will I relay you, the man. message for you. All right, carry on you guys. We'll see you at the eclipse. Thank you, Bill. That was Bill Nye, CEO of the Planetary Society and our famous science guy. I want to bring Eric back on to tell us what's coming up next. Eric, welcome back. What did you Hi think there. of our chat with Bill? That was that was so great. I, I mean, it's just so obvious that he's a storyteller of science and really has this amazing depth and breadth of knowledge. Like the thing that stuck with me and I think will stick with me for a while is when he said, you can lock me in there in my house, but there will still be craters. Just that sentiment I think is really powerful and, and speaks volumes but yeah. uh, all these little tidbits that he had it was just very inspiring and how, how did it feel to uh, talk with the person that was in the elementary schools across the country in the 90s whenever there was a substitute teacher it was Bill Nye that was our substitute teacher how, how was your experience 
Oh, it was a childhood dream come true. I grew up watching him. And like you said, he was a substitute teacher in my fourth grade class. And then yes. getting to meet and speak with him, it was a great follow up to him walking in on my thesis defense back in April. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Yeah. So what's the verdict? Angstroms or nanometers now? Actually, neither. <laughs> so it was in microns. He might oh, be microns. in fact. Yeah. So, yeah, we're talking 10 to the negative six. Okay. So that it was it was a, a switch <laughs> ending. I... I I, I feel like we're in the sixth Surprise sense here. Surprise ending. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm so, so glad that you had the opportunity. That was a great uh, interview. Thanks so much for uh, being on the show here today, Paige. Thank you for having me. <laughs> have a great rest of your day. Happy uh, solstice. Now, coming up on the show, we have another very special guest. We'll be talking to Phil Plate, the man behind Bad Astronomy and Crash Course Astronomy. Seems like astronomy is in there a lot. Seems like he might know stuff about astronomy. So yes, uh, we'll be talking about some of the common misconceptions surrounding the sun and eclipses. And later we'll get an update on our plans for the transcontinental total solar eclipse that is coming up in this August. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Give the gift of the universe. Give the gift of SLU. A celebration of every magical moment in the night sky. For just $60, you can give the budding space explorer in your life the gift of a full year of SLU membership. It's available now at slu.com. Hi there, and welcome back to our celebration of the June solstice here on SLU. And as we look live at the sun through our telescope feed, we're looking from the Solar Dynamics Observatory at this bright, brilliant ball of light above us. We're talking all about the sun here today, both celebrating the solstice and looking forward to the transcontinental eclipse coming up in August. So we're bringing in the big guns, the experts who can tell us all about the sun. That includes our very next guest, Phil Plate. He is the man behind Bad Astronomy. Call him over at Sci-Fi Wire. He's also the host of Crash Course Astronomy on YouTube. Thanks for so much for coming on the show, Phil. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And so just to start us off, we have the sun right here before us, and it's not often that we can just look at the sun directly with our eyes. Do you have parts of the sun that you really enjoy seeing when you get that chance to see the sun? <laughs> Well, I'd have to say my favorite layer of the sun is the photosphere. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I actually I, I do uh, observe the sun every now and again. I've got some um, some some solar safe binoculars here and uh, an H alpha telescope, which blocks most of the light of the sun and lets you see the magnetic activity going on on the surface, much like this shot right here. And um, I really like it when there are uh, flares coming off the edge, or, or well, not flares, excuse me, prominences, these towering eruptions of gas. Uh, also, you, in this image, you can see some of these filaments, which are basically the same thing as prominences, but seen against the face of the sun, they look dark. And it's pretty neat to see them winding across the face, especially when you're looking at it through a telescope with your own eye. Very cool stuff. An active sun is always fun. And today, you know, this being a very sun special day, the solstice, uh, I was wondering, since we have you, the great debunker of scientific misinformation, <laughs> uh, there's a really, I think, very common misconception people have about astronomy that has to do with the solstice. And I was wondering, could you tell us a bit about why we have seasons and how that relates to the solstice? Oh, uh, oh, we're going to go way back. Sure. <laughs> um, we have seasons um, basically for one reason, and that, that is the Earth is tilted with respect to its orbit around the sun. And a lot of people think uh, because the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, sometimes we're closer to the sun and sometimes we're farther away, and that's why we have seasons. And it's diagrams like this, actually, that, that they're, they're good, they're solid, they show you what's going on, but they can kind of reinforce this idea that uh, uh, the Earth's orbit is really, really elliptical. It's not nearly that elliptical. It's more like a circle. Uh, it's just a little bit elliptical. And plus, we're closer to the sun in December uh, and January, which is when it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's clearly not the reason we have seasons. It's because of this tilt. And what happens is when you're tilted, 
when the, when the tilt of the uh, the earth is pointing more toward the sun or i guess here like this you know pointing toward the camera like that um the sun gets up higher in the sky the sunlight is is more concentrated on the ground it's not hitting the ground at an angle because of the curved earth uh, and days are longer and all three of these things combine to basically allow the earth to heat up more when the axis is tilted toward it. When it's tilted away, you have the opposite effect. The, the sunlight is coming in at a, at, a, at a much lower angle. The days are much shorter. And um, uh, there was something else that I said too, is days are shorter, lower angle. And that third reason, which I actually don't even remember what I said a minute ago, um, but that is basically, uh, that makes it uh, less efficient to heat, the, to heat the earth and you get much colder days. Uh, and uh, um, and you get winter. And these happen at the same time, right? When the northern hemisphere is pointed toward the sun, the southern hemisphere is pointed away. So right now, um, a lot of people are calling this the summer solstice. It's actually a little bit more politically correct. Or, you know, it's even maybe a little bit more sensitive to folks in the southern hemisphere to call this the June solstice. Uh, it happens in June, and it, that happens to be the summer solstice for us in the northern hemisphere, but it's winter solstice in the southern hemisphere. So Australia gets the, yeah, their winter time in the middle of our summertime. It's, it's interesting to think about. And so you talk so much about a lot of different astronomy topics uh, in your tenure with Bad Astronomy, uh, sometimes the news, sometimes pop culture. I recently uh, read your piece on Daphnis, uh, Saturn's moon, and the waves and Saturn's rings. I found that amazing. I, I was yeah. wondering if you had, out of all these topics that you've written about, uh, what would maybe be... Uh, your your favorite, uh, if you have a favorite or maybe a couple favorites that you really enjoy talking about a lot. Boy, I yeah, um, I I love writing about everything I write about, and it's hard to pick a favorite. I mean, certainly, uh, like today, for example, I wrote about um, a gigantic black hole in the center of a galaxy called Cygnus A, and um, that was a lot of fun. I love writing about black holes. Uh, and, and most people respond to black holes really well, too, because they're so bizarre. Um, it's It's... You know, it's painful to write about misconceptions. Um, you know, somebody's on YouTube saying that NASA's covering up an asteroid impact or, you know, UFOs or whatever. Um, those can be, I don't want to say fun to write. They're, they can be satisfying uh, to really to really slap, slap at something that I know is getting spread around and is completely wrong. Not only wrong, but that is designed to scare people. You know, there's some impending... Uh, a disaster happening and that, you know, the man is hiding it from you. And that really, that really makes me upset. So there is, as, as galling and upsetting as it is to write about it, there is a satisfaction with putting it up and, and, and knowing that, you know, you're writing a wrong a little bit. And sort of on that subject, I was wondering, since you've written so much, has there ever been a time when your words have been, say, uh, twisted somehow to take the form of evidence for any of these conspiracies or misinformation <laughs> campaigns that go on the internet. Like, for example, us here on SLU, uh, the SLU uh, observatory engineer, Paul Cox, once made an offhand joke that there was a second sun. And there was this huge conspiracy about there being a second sun that everybody was hiding. Uh, have you had an experience like that? Yeah, in fact, I have. Uh, most of the time, it's just that I'm a, you know, a paid NASA shill or big pharma or big climate, whatever that is. Whenever I talk about, you know, vaccines being important and climate change being real. Uh, and if I'm writing about uh, UFOs not being real or Nibiru, you know, this, this extra planet in the solar system that swings through the inner solar system and creates havoc, which absolutely does not exist. When I write about that, I'm basically just shut down. They just say, you know, I'm wrong, I'm lying, I'm being paid to say all this stuff. When in fact, I mean, they're, they're, the evidence that they're, what they're trying to produce is so ridiculous and all the evidence is against them. But there has been a time actually back in the day uh, when I was first starting out doing this and I was writing about the, uh, the moon landings, uh, people who said the moon landings are fake. And there was, uh, that was very popular for a few months. And I was doing a lot of interviews on news stations that were like, so what's this conspiracy? And I did one for a German station. I was a little leery of doing it because I, you know, I didn't know how they were going to treat it. And sure enough, I heard from people in Germany that, that they twisted my words, they left stuff out, and they made it look like I couldn't answer the questions that they were asking. So, you know, what are you going to do if they're, you know, people are just going to do that. So you just roll with it, I guess. Yeah, they'll get their sound bite. But so yeah. with this experience, uh, do you think, are there ways that scientists, educators, people that are passionate about a subject and want to 
uh, provide, communicate correct information about that subject, give people an accurate perspective? Are there you know, tips you could give people like that for ways to make their words less prone to, say, co-opting by conspiracies to make sure that the, the truth shines through? Um, if you're doing it online, you know, on Twitter or whatever, it, you know, it, it's going to be what it is. They're, they're going to take your words out of context no matter what you do. Um, the two things I would suggest, this is just, this is just how I've uh, worked over the past couple of years, few years, is, is first of all, pick your battles. Uh, if it's some random person on Twitter with two followers, you're wasting your time, right? And that that person's not gonna they're not gonna listen to you and you're shouting into the into the void anyway. Um, so if it's you know a big news station or somebody with you know, who has a big following or something like that, and I'm not saying just pick celebrities or anything like that. I just mean if you're gonna spend time doing this, you know choose choose your battles so that you're gonna maximize the efficiency of what you're doing. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another one is, uh, you know, I've said this and other people have said this, I'm not the first, don't be a dick. Uh, you know, be, you, don't, don't get in somebody's face. Don't yell at them. Don't, you know, uh, uh, call them names, be firm, right? Don't back down, stand up. I'm not saying let them roll all over you. I'm just saying you don't have to stoop necessarily to their level. Just, you know, keep it on a, keep it on a, a, a higher level. And what will happen is even if that person isn't convinced, people who are watching will say this person was being a jerk and this person wasn't. Uh, and, and it's easier to swallow that lesson if it's, uh, if it's done a little bit nicely. Yeah, keep it to the facts, no personal attacks, my personal motto. <laughs> and yeah. so... so yeah, there's a lot of, you know, sun-related stuff that's going on, and it's it, great to make sure we know what we're talking about when we're talking about the sun. And we also have this, you know, road trip to the transcontinental total solar eclipse in August that's coming up. And I was wondering, related to eclipses, do you have any favorite myths or misconceptions about these eclipses? Well, I think the biggest one is that if you look at an eclipse, you'll go blind. And uh, this is not... This is one of these, these, these myths that is a little bit hard to dissect. It's not really true. Um, if you're looking, you know, if, let, me, let me try it this way. Up until the moment that the sun is completely blocked by the moon, yes, looking at the sun is not a good idea. Nobody, as far as I can tell, and I want to make that caveat, I, I've done some research on this and I've talked to some, um, some people who study retinal pathology. Ooh. Um, and basically, nobody has ever gone permanently and completely blind by looking at the sun. In other words, nobody's gone totally blind, they can't see anything, forever. There can be permanent uh, slight blindness, where you have spots burned into your retina, uh, and there can be temporary permanent blindness, where you can't see anything, but that tends to, that tends to go away. Um, having said that, don't stare at the sun. It's a bad idea, right? Uh, so... Up until the moment that the sun is completely blocked, use your protective uh, glasses, use, use your binoculars, use your, 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 your eclipse glasses or whatever is, is considered safe. Then once the moon completely blocks the sun, it's perfectly safe to look at. The sun's corona comes out. That's not very bright. It's maybe about as bright as the full moon. Absolutely safe to look at. However, for the two minutes or so of totality, your eye starts to adapt to the darkness. Your pupil dilates, chemicals flush your retina that make it more sensitive to light. When the moon moves off the sun, suddenly, I believe that's third contact is the technical term, your eye is flooded with light from the sun again, and it's basically saying, ah, feed me, because it, the pupil's open, the chemicals are in there. And that's the dangerous part. That's where you can hurt your eye. So personally for me, when I go to see this eclipse, going to be completely safe, use all my safe stuff. Once the totality starts, I'm going to look at it with my eye. I'm even going to use binoculars for like a minute. Where I'm going to be, it's about two and a half minutes of totality. But I'm going to cut it really, really safe and make sure that uh, I have everything set up so that when the sun is uh, unblocked by the moon, I'm not looking at it or I'm looking at it safely. So you heard it from Phil, folks. Make sure that you keep your eyes safe. There's certain times, but not the whole eclipse. You, you got to be careful with it. And so, Phil, thank you so much for joining us here on this broadcast. It was great to talk with you. My pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> so that was Phil Plate, the man behind Bad Astronomy and Crash Course Astronomy al alongside a host of other gigs. Now, coming up, uh, now that we've whet your appetite for the
the solstice and the eclipse. Now it's time to find out everything you need to know about SLU's transcontinental total solar eclipse road trip. You can join us in Stanley, Idaho for the biggest show of the year in person or by live stream. And we'll have all details about that when Paul Cox joins us next. Uh, plus, we'll be talking or we'll be taking a look at our community content over on SLU to see what stories and artwork you have submitted celebrating today's solstice. So stick around. We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at slu.com. Space is limited. Hi there, and welcome back to our celebration of the June solstice, politically correct way to say it, here on SLU. I'm your host, Eric Edelman, and we've been talking all about the sun on today's show. It's a big topic, both literally and both in particularly figuratively today, uh, including sharing our excitement for 2017's main event here in the United States, the transcontinental total solar eclipse. And we are gearing up for that event in a major way here on SLU, planning a massive country-spanning uh, country road trip ending in Stanley, Idaho for the big event. And here to talk more about that with us and to explore our community content is SLU astronomer Paul Cox. Paul, welcome to the show. Good evening, Eric. Thank you very much for Hi, welcoming me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm just sitting in our village, and our village is overrun here with druids. We're only really? a few miles. We're only a few miles away from Stonehenge oh, here. Oh yes! And now they're all heading off uh, from Stonehenge this morning off to uh, a music festival in Glastonbury. So uh, yeah, the village is overrun with with strange-looking druidy type people. I'm glad you're in your house and not in the traffic. I don't think you could get anywhere today. <laughs> I don't think you could. No, absolutely not. But Paul, how have you been enjoying our show here today, seeing the sun, not at Stonehenge, but here on SLU? How's, how's it been going? Well, uh, great. Um, great guest tonight, Bill Nye. Who'd have thought? Bill Nye on SLU. That was yes. pretty cool. And of course, Phil Plate. I've been reading his stuff. I've been watching his programs. I've been reading his Bad Astronomy website, you know, since it first started. I don't think you were born then, but, uh, you know, so great fan of Phil and, as ever, talking loads of sense. Although... He did make one small mistake. He mentioned Nibiru, he mentioned Second Sun, he mentioned moon hoaxes. I think the SLU uh, crew in, uh, in the studio could probably cut all of that down to a lovely little kind of five minute segment where he's saying all of those things are actually quite true. Oh, so, so Germany all over again. Uh, we're yeah. not gonna make this a second Germany for you, Phil, I promise, we're not gonna, I won't let them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, even saying the words can be the topic somebody needs. Exactly. And so, but you know, you are somebody who's, I like to call you our observatory engineer because you have your hands in all the telescopes a lot of the time. And I'm wondering what you thought of the live imagery we've been getting. We've been seeing a lot of the solar dynamics observatory. We've been seeing a bit of SLU's feed as well. Uh, what have you been thinking about the sun here? Well, I mean, we've been getting these great views and, and actually this is, you know, this is from the SLU Solar Telescope. This is our newest telescope at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. It's home to some of the world's largest solar telescopes. And this has been absolutely mesmerizing to watch every single day. And you know, longest day of the year is normally bad news for astronomers because most astronomers like looking at stuff at night. So of course, longest day of the year means the shortest night. Here in the UK, certainly at northern latitudes, you know, it doesn't really get properly dark even in the middle of the night. But the upside of this is that we get at least 12 hours a day of these glorious 
hydrogen alpha views of the sun live. Uh, SLU members can watch it all the time, snap their own images, and been sharing some great content and great images as well from those telescopes. Yeah, the community sharing, it's, it's really, I think, one of the funnest things to do when it comes to viewing these astronomical objects, because everybody's going to have their own interpretation of things, their own yeah. perspective. We're seeing something interesting that nobody else has seen before. And so, you know, speaking of community, you know, we've been talking about the sun today, but we also have that road trip for the transcontinental oh, total solar eclipse in August. That's a huge community event. And I was hoping I could talk with you a bit about that. Like, how can SLU yeah. members join us there? Well, people may not know yet, uh, but we are hosting uh, a festival over the entire eclipse weekend. And we're going to be celebrating like kind of all things relating to the sun and moon. And as you said, the best part is that all SLU apprentice and astronomer members and their families can join us in Stanley, Idaho for a free weekend of fun uh, science, we're going to have some music and we're going to have loads more all at this exclusive campsite uh, for SLU members. It's going to be a weekend to remember. Starts on Friday, August 18th and runs all the way through till Tuesday the 22nd. It is going to be really memorable. So SLU members, if you haven't already done so, uh, you can go to the website and just reserve your spot on the registration page uh, for SLU road trips. And so you were mentioning a campsite. So yes, there, there's going to be this SLU campsite that's going to be available for the community to hang out with, in, enjoy all these different events. I'm, I'll am i personally uh, be at this campsite there hanging around. And there's also going to be uh, different areas as well. There's the Idaho Rocky Mountain Ranch, uh, yeah. and there's going to be sort of feeds and events coming there. And also, I believe our SLU Observatory Engineer, Paul, is going to be in the SLU Mobile Observatory, traveling to and fro, getting uh, the telescopes and people where, <laughs> where they need to go. Uh, could you tell us a little bit uh, about, you know, the different areas that will be there uh, at that eclipse event? Yeah, uh, so uh, as you say, we're at two sites. Now we're going to have uh, great fun at the campsite. You're going to be stationed there all the time. I know Paige is going to be stationed there all the time. I'm going to be split between the, the two sites that we've got. So loads of fun at the campsite, but the SLU team, the other half of the broadcast team at the Idaho Rocky Mountain Ranch have kind of landed on their feet. It is exquisite. I mean, look at these photos that we've got of it. It's a kind of true wilderness getaway uh, where you can kind of really unplug and reconnect with nature, which is really kind of fitting for an eclipse because really you want to dump all your technology and just soak up a total solar eclipse, you know, just with yourself. Uh, but the area, as you can see here, I mean, it's stunningly beautiful. Um, and the ranch normally is, is a real haven for outdoor lovers. Uh, but it has the advantage of having luxuries of great cuisine. They've got hot springs, a hot spring pool. Uh, they've even got a spa there as well. So I, I'm not kind of trying to make you feel bad that you're going to be at the campsite. I'm going to be splitting my time between the two. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're just going to have great fun at both locations. It's, it's going to be an absolute right. And, and as you said, actually, um, we're driving from uh, SLU HQ in Connecticut. Uh, in the SLU Mobile Observatory. And we are going along the line of totality all the way to Idaho. And uh, if anybody out there is uh, local news stations or radio stations uh, or wants to meet us along the way, then uh, just drop an email to press at slu.com. It will be a big adventure. And yeah, going across that trail itself, just preparing for it, I think the anticipation is going to build in a really fun way. And well, so for people that end up going to the campsite, uh, for any of you campers out there that want to join us, uh, so I've heard that that campsite's gonna be split into four base camps, is that right? Yes, and that kind of uh, follows um, what, what we kind of do at SLU with these kind of different uh, areas. So. The four base camps, we've got science log, we've got art and culture, human spirit, and do it yourself. So when members sign up for each particular um, bit of base camp, um, they can choose which area they want to be in. So you you know you're going to land up with, you know, members who are kind of all into the science staff or maybe the human spirit staff with some of the yoga crowd. But of course, we're all around one big campfire as well but you know all of that feeds into or all of that feeds into what we call our community content um, 
which is, uh, I think, what we're going to come to next. Uh, I uh, think we actually might have to wrap up on this segment here, uh, but there's a lot of exciting community content that you can explore on slu.com. And I want to thank you so much, Paul, for joining us uh, here tonight. It's been great for, to hear all about what we can expect in these coming months. Okay. Thank you, Eric. And now coming up, uh, now uh, we want to, you to come with us to Stanley, but if you can't make it and still want to experience the eclipse, we'll actually be speaking to the Weather Channel's Ari Sarsolari to find out where along the path will give you the best chance of viewing uh, this eclipse. And then speaking of eclipses, as we've been speaking of a lot these days, these events offer lots of opportunities to do plenty of science on that day. And we'll spe be speaking to Matt Penn, the organizer behind one gigantic experiment. So for all of that, Stay with us. We'll be right back. We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at SLU.com. Space is limited. Hello and welcome to our celebration of the June solstice here on SLU as we look live on the sun through our telescope feed. Uh, we got a lot of feeds going across the world. Currently we're looking at the Solar Dynamics Observatory feed. It's quite an impressive look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet, a very, very energetic sun. And we've been talking all about the big glowing orb in the sky, the sun, both celebrating the solstice and also looking ahead to the transcontinental total solar eclipse in just two months. Earlier, we talked to SLU astronomer Paul Cox about our own plans to travel across the country to witness the event in person. And it's an event that you can join on in if you happen to be a SLU member. So yeah, we're heading to Stanley, Idaho, but this eclipse will be visible across the country. This is what makes it so amazing, so accessible to so many different people that may never have had a chance to see a total solar eclipse before. So one question that you might want to ask yourself if you're looking to make this trip on your own, well, where should you go if you want the best chance of some good weather? And that's what our next guest is here to tell us. Ari Sarsalari is a meteorologist with the Weather Channel and the host of the Ari Effect. Ari, thanks so much for joining us here today. You got it. No problem, man. I get people asking me about like their weddings a couple months in advance all the time. <laughs> a little bit tough to forecast that far in advance, but we can give you like little ideas here and there. No time travel possibilities or anything? Unfortunately no. not. I wish we could do the old Calvin and Hobbes, hop in the box and head into the future and the past, but we can't do it. <laughs> if only. So, yeah, it's, it's a rough question, but the transcontinental total solar eclipse, two months away oh, for folks looking maybe for good places, places to that would be a reasonable bet, even if there's it's so far in advance. What might be yeah. some loose recommendations? So in general, this is actually a really good time of year for this to be happening. If it happened in the winter, you know, I mean, it would really not be good because not many places would probably have a good chance at seeing it. But you got a lot of things going on in the summer as compared to the opposite season, right? So in the summer, uh, one thing that will generally happen is the jet stream migrates up toward the north. So you get big time ridging over like the western and the central part of the country for you know a good chunk of the summer especially in august and we made a little graphic here for you to see um so here's the idea with the jet stream basically it steers all the storm systems that come in from the west and usually the cloudiness is associated with storm systems not always the case and i'll get into some of this in a minute but in general you're going to have a lot more active weather across the country in the winter because the jet stream is kind of steering storm systems into the country. When you get into the summer and that jet stream migrates up toward the north, there's a lot of stuff that kind of misses and it's generally not set up such that the storms are as strong, you don't have as much cloudiness, you've got all that ridging going on and basically underneath ridges usually what you have is just a lot of clear weather, high pressure, good weather. Um, 
gosh, if I had to pick a place, I'd probably say a little bit, probably the farthest toward the west on the path you can get uh, would, would probably be your best bet. I'm down here in Atlanta. I'm not going to have a very good shot um, at seeing it for many reasons, one of them being that my wife is has, is going to have a baby in the middle of August, and I don't know exactly when that's going to be. Well, um, congratulations, but, though. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, you know, I was talking about um, some of the other things other than just storm clouds associated with big storm systems. You know, uh, one thing that we do get very frequently in the summer, especially kind of closer to the southeastern part of the path of this eclipse, is... Um, bubble up thunderstorms in the afternoon. See, in, in the central plains, in the northwest, there's not enough moisture around this time of year to uh, really get storms going just from the instability, instability of the air that actually the sun causes. I know we're talking about the sun a lot here. But basically what happens in the southeast during the summer is that the sun warms things up, um, you've got a lot of moisture around, and these thunderstorms will just bubble up. And they usually happen during the afternoon, and then they will kind of die down as, it, as you know, the sun goes down and you lose some of that heating. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's a better chance that there might be some clouds around in places like, for instance, you know, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia. Uh, better chance that there would be clouds around there than there would be in places like Idaho, Nebraska. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, fair enough. And yeah. So what I'm hearing is it sort of might be a good idea to be flexible about all of this. And so sort of a follow-up I have is that if somebody wanted to try and be really flexible, they had a goal and they were going to check the weather a few days in advance, but they also wanted to check it uh, far enough in advance that they could change their plans. What do you think would be the sweet spot? How many days uh, before the eclipse would be that optimal time to check the weather and make the decision about where to go? I would say probably you could get away with about seven days or so. Um, look, we're not going to be able to get a an accurate, like a super accurate forecast seven days out. There's the big secret from a meteorologist. I know you watch you watch your local news all the time. And look, I mean, you go on the app, you're going to get a forecast. But, you know, you start to get five to seven and farther than that out, and the confidence in the forecast goes down quite a bit. You know, really, we're only at a point in the science where we can accurately forecast, most often at least, um, you know, three to five days in advance. But one other thing I didn't hit on, which kind of ties into your question, is um, August. I, I almost forgot to talk about this. It just kind of uh, went into my head because we've been following Tropical Storm Cindy. Tropical season, right? So especially when we're talking about the southeastern part of that um, solar eclipse track, you know, what if there's a tropical system coming in from the east? This is when, I'm, when you're talking about some of that long-term forecasting. That is one of those things that you can get a pretty good idea in the long term of what could be going on. Like if we have a storm that's out in the Atlantic and we've got a cone on it and we know that in like five to seven days, whether it's a tropical storm or a hurricane or the remnants of a storm, that there's going to be a bunch of cloudiness that's going to be ejected into the southeastern part of the United States, that would be something you could look at seven days in advance and be like, oh man, maybe I should avoid that area and try to head northwest. Makes a lot of sense. And so there's a lot of factors yeah. I'm hearing that are uh, you have to keep in play here. And so we wish everybody who's venturing any which way luck in that possibility. And yes, make sure to check your weather, check what's going on in the area so you can get the best chance you have of not being disappointed. It can be that one cloud that can just ruin the whole experience. But all right, It could totally so happen, much. too. I mean, there are situations where, like I said, those bubble up thunderstorms. You could have a completely clear day. Everybody sets up to watch the eclipse. And then all of a sudden, a really quick thunderstorm pops up, and it's up for just the duration of the eclipse. I mean, I'm sure there are people that are probably going to experience that. So good luck, everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for joining us here to talk about all this stuff. We appreciate your knowledge. You bet. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, coming up, we'll also be speaking with Matt Penn, the organizer behind One Giant Experiment to Study the Sun from one end of the eclipse to the other, getting a very, very full picture of what's going on. So yes, stay tuned. Give the gift of the universe. Give the gift of SLU. A celebration of every magical moment in the night sky. For just $60, you can give the budding space explorer in your life the gift of a full year of SLU membership. 
It's available now at slu.com. Hi there, everybody, and welcome back to our celebration of the June solstice here on SLU. I'm your host, Eric Edelman, and we've been talking all about the sun on today's show, including sharing our excitement for what comes in the future beyond the solstice uh, for the United States transcontinental total solar eclipse, quite a mouthful. And our group is planning uh, here at SLU a massive undertaking for the event, uh, and so it's going to be very exciting from the SLU side. And also, other people are doing some really great stuff when it comes to this eclipse as well. One group in particular stringing together a series of around 60 different telescopes across the eclipse path to image the sun for the entire event. So Matt Penn is one of the organizers of the Citizen Continental America Telescope Eclipse, or Kate experiment. And he's here to tell us more about all of that. So Matt, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Eric. This is great timing to talk about the eclipse as we're two months out. Uh, the clock is ticking. Oh, right. Yeah, it's going to. So this is the 21st of June and it's on the 21st of August as well. So we're in this even numbers. It's great. We have sun related 21st days. And speaking of this great sun, uh, so we've been having some wonderful feeds looking at the sun today where we don't have to ruin our eyes to look at it. We can just see it through our, our computer screens, whatever devices we're using. And I was wondering what you were thinking of with these live sort of feeds, do you enjoy seeing the sun for yourself? Oh, oh yeah, you know, it's it's my day job, right? I'm, I'm a solar <laughs> astronomer. Uh, I work at Kitch Peak, normally in the infrared, but I've used a lot of the NASA images that you're uh, showing for uh, science papers. And uh, it's just a fascinating object. You know, mostly in astronomy, you look at objects that are mostly stationary and don't change with time. The sun changes every 30 seconds. So it's a really dynamic and exciting object. And it's, it's so close by to us, so related to our own experience as we get with this, well, we really hits home with this solstice day here today. And so with this experiment, this Citizen Kate experiment, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what the plan is for the eclipse. Yeah, so um, here's the idea. The idea is if you're at one location, you'll be able to see the corona, the atmosphere of the sun for about two minutes or maybe two and a half minutes. And because the corona is so huge, um, we know that there are flows and, and dynamical events in the corona, but we really can't see a lot of change in just two minutes. Um, but if you're able to look at from the time the moon hits the Oregon coast until it travels across to South Carolina, 93 minutes elapse. So if you can set up telescopes along the path and take images and then combine them into one continuous movie, you can observe changes in the corona for 93 minutes. Um, this is something that has not been done in, in this part of the corona, in this part of the atmosphere. And so we're excited about uh, seeing a new view of the of the solar uh, corona and looking at some of the mysteries that still exist there. Yeah, the solar corona, it's, it's, it's so amazing to see when you just see uh, uh, some of the most amazing uh, images that come out of people's eclipse expeditions and just the sprawling corona. So seeing it for as much time as possible totally makes sense to me just from a, an aesthetic standpoint, but also the science will probably be incredible. And uh, so I've heard that there's going to be a lot of citizen scientists associated with this event, people that aren't necessarily professional astronomers. And I was wondering uh, what uh, was a part of that decision to use the citizen scientists for this mission? Well, it turns out that the, the um, you know, the environment in the path of totality is really unique. When we study the corona, either from space or from the ground, it's what's called a background limited problem. And we're really constrained by the amount of background light, how bright the sky is um, when we're trying to study the corona. But during a to total eclipse, you can actually use really small telescopes and still get world-class data. So um, I like to mention that we're using 80 millimeter telescopes, you know, three and a half inch telescopes, rather small by, by even amateur astronomy standards. But if you took that out of the path of totality and put it on um, Haleakala, it would correspond to about a 1.3 meter telescope. I'm, I'm sorry, if you put it in the path of totality. So we can really collect world-class uh, data just from the location of being in the totality path. Uh, I like to say that people, you know, millions of people can walk out on their, their back porch in their slippers and collect world-class data. They don't have to travel to a mountain for this eclipse. So um, the idea of having continuous coverage, though, really dictates that we have to have at least 40 or 50 telescopes. And with the topography and the access that we've, we've found, uh, we're going to have 68 telescopes along the path. Um, so getting 68 volunteers from the solar physics community would be really tough. Uh, but turns out experts live along the path. Amateur astronomers are across the entire country. 
And so the idea was why not rely on their expertise and their skill um, to help us collect data? It, it's great that we live in a time when astronomy can be crowdsourced in this way with Zooniverse, uh, with exoplanet hunters, uh, with people that in person can just, uh, they yeah, they don't have to be associated with that uh, spectacular university. They can, with their own hands and with equipment that's not necessarily on the top of Mauna Kea, they can make their own big breakthroughs uh, with science. And so on that topic, I'm wondering, so what are you hoping, what are you expecting to come out of this uh, information? What are you hoping to learn from uh, this Citizen Kate experiment? Yeah, so um, you know, just like forecasting the weather, we really can't forecast what the corona is going to show us on that day. Mm. We would love to have a big coronal mass ejection, for instance, coming out of the sun, but it's only 90 minutes, so that's unlikely. We do know that there will be polar plumes, so very fine filaments rising above the north and the south poles of the sun, and it's still a mystery about how the solar wind gets accelerated in those polar plumes. So we're going to focus on that. That's going to be our first paper with 200 co-authors is what is the acceleration and what is the, the speed of these gas uh, flows in these very fine polar plume threads? Turns out that right now it's unknown to about a factor of 100, um, but we're going to get some real uh, accurate measurements with the Kate data as we track features in these plumes and, uh, and refine that science, really make a revolutionary um, uh, work in that science. Uh, I look forward to you know, hearing more about that paper. That should be very interesting. And speaking of the future, uh, so this is one uh, community sort of citizen scientist crowdsourcing a uh, way to do a project. And I'm wondering in, in the future, do you have more thoughts for more ways that sort of you might personally involve citizen scientists or that you'd hope that we involve citizen scientists in other ways? Are there more you know, outreach uh, projects that are on the horizon potentially? Yes, and, and that was a key point for this project, and it made my life a little more difficult. From the very onset, we wanted to make sure that the funding was set up in such a way that on August 22nd, everybody keeps their telescopes, and that's going to happen. So we'll have telescopes donated to the schools, to the universities, and to the citizen scientists who are taking data. So um, imagine, if you will, a network of 68 astronomers across the country that have the same telescope, a nice imager, and they're trained to use it. Um, you know, the sky's the limit. We're looking at making measurements of comets, for instance, or variable stars, or certainly solar observing as well. So um, through Kate, we've enabled um, a group of sort of advanced citizen scientists, but uh, we're hoping to continue their uh, involvement in citizen science for many years after the eclipse. That is really exciting to hear. It seems like a gift that's going to keep on giving. So Matt, thank you so much for telling us all about this and for coming on the show here tonight. My pleasure. Well, yeah, thank you again. And now, this is going to wrap it up here for us today for this SLU show. We hope that you've enjoyed uh, all the conversations we've had with this variety of guests giving you different perspectives, not only on the solstice, but what's coming up with this transcontinental total solar eclipse. This has been a sun-filled day, and I hope it's also been a fun-filled day. So, of course, a big thanks to our guests, Bill Nye, Phil Blake, Matt Penn, Ari Sarsalari, all these people, of course, uh, Paul Cox as well. And you can join in on keeping an eye on all things that are happening in space, from meteor showers and comets to the sun, the moon, the planets, making a reservation on our telescopes in the Canary Islands and Chile. Any paying member, really, can reserve time on all of our telescopes, looking live at stars and planets and galaxies and nebulae and all sorts of celestial objects and happenings. And next week, we're actually going to be welcoming another a very special guest, Abigail Harrison, known online as Astronaut Abby, wonderful alliteration, will be joining, uh, she will be joining us to look live at the gas giant Saturn and consider what exploration of our solar system looks like when we go beyond Mars. We like Mars a lot, but there's a lot of other things out there for us to investigate. And as we've been telling you all night, plans are well underway for the main event of the year, the transcontinental total solar eclipse. There will be no better place to enjoy the eclipse than at our event in Stanley. It is free to SLU members, and there are still spots available for campers. So go to slu.com now to reserve your spot. And that's all coming up here on SLU, so join the community, interact with other members, and tune in. So yes, that's been our show here tonight. I'm Eric Edelman, and you've been watching SLU. Have a great time, and thanks so much for stopping by. <laughs>